out here. Court number one. Top spin lob. And it's Game good. Second set set and three. Danny Safford has just even two. this match at a set apiece. 6 1 to Henman. Second set. We're even on court one. One set all. Wimbledon's fortnight continues with the 110th championship at the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club. Well, it's appropriate you just got to look at Tim Hanman because we've been telling you about the sudden wave of British success here. Six English players into the second round of the men's draw. Quickly, we'll give you their names and keep in mind as we do that there has been some cannibalism here because Tim Henman, as you know, is playing Danny Sapsford at this moment, so only one of those two can advance, and the winner of that match will play Milligan in the next round if, in fact, he advances. So this number will be winnowing down as we go along, but nevertheless, people are still talking here in London about the drama of Henman's five-set come-from-behind victory over Yevgeny Kafelnikov of Russia the other day. For more on that and Henman's new role as England's hero, here's Frank DeFord with a Wimbledon report. In the classic English story of youth and dreams and magic, Peter Pan implores us to help save Tinkerbell. Clap, he says, if you believe in fairies. Well, after 60 years of home court futility at Wimbledon, we all have the same sensation whenever a single British tennis player manages to win just one big match. Listen now. Clap if you still believe in English tennis. The latest young savior to receive this national benediction is a thin, ruddy-cheeked six-footer named Tim Henman. Tuesday on center court, exhibiting a much-improved serve, he went up two sets on the French Open champion Yevgeny Kafelnikov, then gave away the next two, he even found himself down two match points in the fifth before rallying for his dandiest victory ever. Until you played in front of that, you, you can't understand what it's like. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. They really did hang in there behind me, and uh, I'm sure that's, that's a great help to me. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I was able to turn things around and pull it out in the end. Nothing is more sensational than an English tennis player who becomes an overnight sensation. England is not tennis crazy, it is merely Wimbledon crazy. And suddenly, the public, the press, and the business community, which never heard of a Tim Henman one day, worships him the next morning. He's now a household name. And I would estimate winning that match and the, the coverage he's got from it, being on the front page of the newspapers, that's probably worth a couple of hundred thousand overnight. But that's just the start. If he can progress and keep going up the rankings, and have a, a, a successful Wimbledon, and he, with his draw now, he could get to the last 16. Uh, potentially, uh, it's going to make him a fortune. All this is perfectly understandable. After all, British culture thrives in music, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, and the theatre. British athletes are preeminent in golf, hugely successful in track and field, and even in noble defeat, England's soccer team has joined the whole country. The British tennis is so bad that merely to say the words is an automatic laugh line. British tennis. British what? <laughs> <laughs> there are even those in England who say that Wimbledon is so successful that it inhibits British tennis. The sport here is like the little rich boy who gets too much money for his own good. And of course, by now, failure begats more failure. If Becker had been British, I don't think he would have been a Wimbledon champion because he would not have gone into tennis. He wouldn't have had the facilities, he wouldn't have had the coaching, he wouldn't have had the people looking after him, it wouldn't have been cared for, he, he would have just disappeared. But maybe the worm is turning. Canadian-born British newcomer Greg Rosetsky gave England a top 50 last year for the first time in a decade, and the world's best junior, Martin Lee, is British. Blimey, six male Brits made it to the fourth day of Wimbledon. Henman is the main man with the talent to be the country's first top tenor since Roger Taylor more than a quarter of a century ago. Plus, he's handsome in a healthy British way, engaging and well-spoken. We can expect the London schoolgirls to go after Henman in full flight. I think this is just the start of something big, and it would not surprise me if Tim Henman is, uh, ends up in the top ten in the world. I think he's that good. 
I'd be lying if I said that you know there wasn't maybe an added expectation on my shoulders, but you, you have to get used to that. Um, I don't think it's affected me so far, and I hope it won't affect me in the future. Unfortunately for young Mr. Hinman, the English soccer team lost in the European Championships at Wembley last night, and so once again, England is without a summer hero. And now, with the football dreams ended, the nation, Tim Henman, turns its lonely eyes to you. Too bad our cameras couldn't locate Tony Lloyd, too, so that all three of the brothers could have commented on the Henman phenomenon. But seriously, folks, uh, British tennis has been such a lovable laughing stock in this country for so long that you almost forget how many glorious British victories there have been over the years here at Wimbledon. Going back to 1970, when Roger Taylor defeated number one, Rod Laver. Taylor made it deep into the draw that year. Then later on, he beat number nine, Clark Gravener. And of course, the two earth-shattering Lloyd victories over number four, Roscoe Tanner in 1977. That one really bears a strong parallel to what Henman was able to pull off against number five, Kafelnikov, the other day. And Lloyd came back to knock off Elliot Telcher in 1985. Nick Brown over Goran Ivanisevic before a crowd of about 11 people out on court 13 in 1991. Jeremy Bates beating Michael Chang. Rosedsky's uh, arrival last year. Tim Henman once again beating Evgeny Kafelnikov on center court. And uh, we couldn't leave this subject without giving you a chance to actually look at our beloved John Lloyd and his moment of glory against Tanner in 1977. John showing off his power game and obliterating Tanner on that day with blistering shots like that one. And in all seriousness, we are proud of him and we're proud that you were able to accomplish that. And uh, I know that that puts some pressure on you, just as Henman's victory is now going to put a good deal of pressure on him. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, he's going to have the tabloids after him. He's going to have all that stuff that's going to go with it. But I think he can handle it. He's a very smart kid, and he's got good people around him. In those days when I was around, we didn't have managers. We didn't have coaches. We didn't know what to do. So we were just out there in the open. And I think Henman's going to, he's going to be very good in this situation. Of course, Henman at only 155 pounds mm -hmm. doesn't yet have the explosiveness mm -hmm. in his game that John at 161 pounds did at that time. <laughs> I think 77 was my first year at Wimbledon, and... I'm a real sucker for the gorgeous blonde and sweet guy look anyway. I married into I married a guy like that and that's why I think part of the reason I like Stefan Edberg so much. So I used to watch every one of this guy's matches and I came back from the courts after he had after you'd played Tanner and everyone knew where I was and, and I'd spent a couple of hours out there and they said, How did he do? And I said, I've got no idea. I was just watching John run around. We got a tight enough shot of John's blush nice, yet. Should we go in tighter and let you see the skin tone on John? <laughs> you you had tell a me nice at the time. <laughs> Jeez, now you tell me. Didn't you marry you enough tennis players? <laughs> <laughs>